all good. So thank you for joining me for today's video. Uh, I'm going to be doing a Q&A and thank you to everyone who has submitted a question on my anonymous online form. I've been very good and not looked at any of the questions. Um, hopefully there'll be some nice questions in there. I imagine there'll be a few silly questions, but we'll deal with those when the time comes. So before I continue, just to remind you that you can still pre-order the book on my website and very excitingly, the pre-order of Chasing Time actually arrived today. Um, it's looking good. Um, it had to change a few of the dimensions on the cover work, but that is all now finalised and good to go, and everyone's pre-ordered copies will be on their way in the next week or so, ready to ship by the 11th, so exciting stuff. I'm not going to read these in any particular order, just as they've come up to me on the screen. First question, do you lick the lid of life? Who have been your biggest influences when it comes to writing? My biggest influences when it comes to writing, I would say, in a literary sense, I would say John Keats. Um, I really enjoyed his poetry at university, really found the Romantic era um, inspiring. So I looked to him a lot when, when I was writing, a, writing poetry myself. But in today's age, I would probably say it's a mix between Rudy Francisco, who is a fantastic spoken word poet, and I really recommend you check him out on YouTube. Someone who isn't really a poet, but is in his own right. The lead singer of Blue October, Justin Furstenfeld, who is a a songwriter, which is poetry in itself. I love his music, I love his songwriting, so he's a big inspiration for me when it comes to writing my own creative works. <laughs> I can imagine this is a Mark Hipwell question. Uh, what are your views on anal bleaching? Yeah, yeah, w scrap that. What's your favourite poem you've ever written and why? My favourite poem that I've ever written, that is a really hard one to answer. So my favourite poems, When I Learned to Love Again, which is one I wrote in 2018 and my friend Eve did a really great video for it, really great animated uh, video with my voice obviously reading the poem. And secondly, there's another spoken word one, um, I wrote that in 2017 and it's called The Process of Losing Your Head in Eight Parts. And um, that's not been put out before but it is in the book and that is, that comes from a very dark time. Something really bad had happened to me and I and I'd completely lost my mind. I decided to take some of that negative energy, or take all of the negative energy and try and turn it into something creative as a way of exercising my demons in a way. And do you know what? It was graphic, it was shocking and I felt guilty for writing it. Um, because that's just how I, I process, how I work, but it really did the job in terms of getting something off my chest and, and when I read it back now I think god that really really feels like I can feel the emotion, I can feel the impact, it has a good tempo and it has a good pace and I can get angry with it and I can get emotional with it and I just think it's really impactful and I really like it. How do you feel looking back at your older diary entries? It's really hard, um, it's really hard to look back at those entries because I was I was in a mess. I I was at a really low point in my life, and and I was really really depressed. And when I wrote those diary entries, I thought I was being melodramatic. I thought something was wrong with me, and it was hard to kind of talk to anyone. So I I I I wrote down what I was thinking and what I wanted to say. And looking back at them, it's kind of upsetting to see how alone I was and how in the thick of it I was. But equally, it makes me feel kind of proud of the progress that I've made since then. I'm in a much better place. I still suffer with mental health. Overall, I'm in a better place. I'm not in that place. And, and I've come through that because of life experiences, but friends mainly. Friends and family have, have been there for me and got me through that. So looking back, yeah, it's sad, but it is kind of reassuring. And it fills me with a little pride to know that, do you know what? People can change. People can overcome. Um, and I'm hoping that by putting those in the books, other people see that too. If you could read one of your poems to your all-time celeb idol, which one would it be? and why and who and would would the celeb be? I think you mean who would the celeb be? My all-time hero is Justin Furstenfeld from Blue October. For Justin I'd probably read When I Learned to Love Again because I think as somebody who has, because he, he's very very vocal about his past depression and addiction, he came through it and now he sings and writes about positivity and kind of overcoming mental mental struggles so I think he'd appreciate that poem from someone who has also come from mental health background but has also chosen to turn that into something inspirational. So I think I'd choose to, to show him that one. <laughs> Have you ever written a poem for someone you fancy but they didn't know you liked them? All of my poetry is about people that I fancy and they don't know I like them. So yeah, there are poems that I've written for people who I fancy and they don't know I like about them, and some of them are in this book. But do you know what? You can't guess who they are. And if you are somebody who I do fancy, and you're asking this in the hope that I tell you I fancy you, message me afterwards. How do you get your inspiration to write poems? 
Generally, I have to be depressed. Strong emotion. Um, I can't really, I really struggle to sit down and write poetry as a job. For me, I have to really, really feel a strong emotion, whether that's heartache, whether that's depression or anxiety or strong feelings of love. I have to feel something in order to be able to write something. And usually when I'm feeling such a strong emotion, there's a line in my head or a few words in my head and I'll keep repeating them to myself. And then I'll think, I need to write this down. And as soon as I write it down, the rest just comes. Do you find talking about your mental health challenging because of the stigma attached to it? I used to, not so much anymore. And this is where I appreciate I'm very different. I used to be afraid of talking about mental health. I used to be ashamed of my depression and my anxiety. And I used to think I'm broken and everyone else seems perfect. And I don't want to burden anyone or lumber anyone with all my issues. But now I just think, do you know what? I don't care. I'm quite happy to say to people, I'm having a bad mental health day. And I know it's taken me years to get to that point of feeling comfortable enough to challenge the stigma. I don't find it as challenging anymore. Um, I think more people are becoming aware of it and accepting of it, but I do still find that people are shocked. What prompted you to release this collection? We know that mental health is an ongoing thing. We know that we still need to get comfortable talking about it and normalising it. Here's someone every day. Here's someone bog standard and normal and isn't a celebrity and they suffer and they're willing to show you their suffering and that's what I kind of thought is if I put my poetry out there and my diary entries especially out there and I do these vlogs and I say yes I have depression yes I have anxiety and I go into that detail maybe someone will think do you know what I I feel those things too and if he's talking about it maybe that's okay and I can talk about it and, and that's really why I thought I'd do this. Uh, have you got any tips for how to establish a creative and inspiring workspace in which to do your writing? Well I currently sit here with Rosie and Jim on the on the on the bedside table so probably not. When I when I'm writing I like to get into a dark space with just a bit of light so if I'm in this bedroom then I'll turn all the lights off and I'll stick a candle on uh, and I'll play some music in the background and I try and just focus on my feelings and try and isolate all external sound. Which poem would be most embarrassing if the person found out it was about them? That probably would be on a sweet starry night um, because it's very very romantic and I wrote that at the age of 19 or 20. It's very romantic, it has lines like you know I look into your eyes a beautiful sunrise, it mentions about making them my wife. I wrote that when I was when I was deeply besotted with someone and uh, I guess it would be embarrassing for them to find out about it. What would you recommend for any aspiring poets? watch poetry. When you watch people perform their own poetry you get to see exactly which bits they're really feeling. When I started watching spoken word poetry it was incredible because you could see which lines and which words really triggered the emotion in their faces, what they were doing with their hands. It just gave me a new appreciation for performance poetry. It made me think, God, I really want to be able to write like that. Many of your poems are about mental health. What would you say to anyone struggling with their mental health, especially in a pandemic? I would say the best thing to do is not to feel guilty about your mental health because I know how easy it is to say I feel really really crap but I know that I've got a job and other people don't have jobs or I feel crap but other people are dying and things like this. This is a really really slippery slope because if you start comparing you then feel guilty for feeling bad and then that worsens your mental health. It's a really obvious thing that happens when you're outside of that zone and you can look back on it. When you're knee deep in it you're a victim to it. Talk to friends, tell them that you're not feeling okay, have a list of things that you know you enjoy doing that you can turn to. Sticking some stand-up comedy on is going to make you laugh at least or going for a walk in the park and you know watching the ducks or something it's going to make you feel better. Just do it. Just just try your best to do it and even if it's one little thing every day the fact that you're trying will give you some sense of fulfillment and it's really really hard in a pandemic. It's really hard. Keep trying the little things you know do work and, and know that there is an end to this. How old were you when you wrote your first poem and can you remember it? No I don't remember it. I do seem to remember writing a poem in like year four and I think I actually got my mum to write most of it and then I took the credit for it and it was like the best poem in the class so I want to put out a public apology to my mum. I didn't really like poetry. But the two poems in this book I've included which I consider to be my first poems and they were in 2011 and 2012 but they're really teenagerish, they're really angsty, and they're really sad. They're what I consider to be my first poems so when I was about 16, 17, coming on 18 they're my first poems really. How do you get inspiration for your work? Life. Things happen and I write about them or I write about how they make me feel. I've been in horrible breakups and I've written poetry about that. I've had loved ones die and I've written about that. I have loved someone with all my heart and they haven't loved me back and I've written about that. Do any of your exes recognise themselves in your work? I bet that was submitted by an ex. I, I don't know. I mean, I've never asked them. Maybe. If 
four Maxes were to buy this book of poetry, I think there's a 40% chance that one of them would say, I think this is about me. If one of my exes bought this book, there'd be a 100% chance that they would say this is about me. I think my friends would recognise my exes in my work. I don't think the exes would. Who knows, really, because I've never really spoken to them to find out. The diary entries are so vulnerable. How did you find the courage to publish them? I don't really feel like it's happened yet. I've kind of just published it and I've just gone blah, 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 blah. I can't see this. So I got the proof today. And, and, and you know, I read the diary entries and I thought they're really strong. They're really, really emotional. And when I read them back, I remember what it was like being in my head at that time. And I feel sad for the younger me. It's really scary to open myself up like that. And I am a bit scared of what people are going to think about me. But I know there's a chance that it might help people feel comfortable talking about it more. If that means that I have to kind of put myself out there and expose myself, so be it. And there's an element of it where I just have to kind of think, well, do you know what? When I publish this video, when I publish this poem, I'm going to close down Facebook, Twitter, shut my laptop down, I'm going to go watch a movie, or I'm going to go for a walk, and I'll come back and I'll deal with whatever comments come through, whatever messages come through. If there's criticism, I'll deal with it. It might be, it might be hard for friends to read it back who maybe knew me at the time. It might be hard for my family to read back, but I'm doing it from a good place. I'm trying to help other people. Can you tell us about the time that you almost shit yourself on New Year's Eve? Okay, I was in New York City on New Year's Eve. It was a three dodgy Turkish restaurant and there was a, a party disco thing afterwards. And we had chicken and I thought it was fine and I ate it. And then I was going up to the bar to collect all my free drinks. And then I just suddenly thought, oh, yeah, I don't feel too great. Anyway, it transpired that I ended up having horrific, what I can only imagine is food poisoning because I was in and out of that toilet all night. The worst part is when you look back at the pictures of me from that night, I am as pale as a sheet, I'm sweating cobs. And that lasted for about a day and a half. Um, so I didn't really enjoy my New Year's because you can't really enjoy New Year's Eve in one of the greatest cities in the world when you're sat in that toilet putting your foot against the door because you don't want anyone to come in, but there's a queue of women outside desperate to piss themselves. It was probably one of the lowest points of my life. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, I'm going to do another Q&A video once people have had a chance to read the book because I think there were some juicier questions in that point. But thank you for watching. Um, as I said, you can still pre-order the book on my website and um, I hope everyone has a great uh, weekend. So thanks very much for watching.